Hey everyone, uh, my name is Rich, and uh, this is Rich Talks Records, uh, episode when I was 17, um, and uh, this is part two of the uh, Rolling Stones uh, Pop Heathens 1965-1967 era. Um, it's hard to say, I don't know, maybe this is my favorite era. Uh, Brian has, you know, I talked about this in the last video, Brian takes up a lot of brain space for me, uh, and kind of, you know, Brian, to me, personifies a lot of what I love about the band. Um, to me, Brian, in some ways, is the ultimate Rolling Stone, um, and, and again, it is, it was his band. Uh, I, I know Keith sometimes tries to make it like, oh, it was Ian Stewart's band. No, it wasn't. I think Bill, and, and that's one of the things I love about Bill Wyman. Bill, Bill is constantly setting the record straight on this. And um, you just look at how innovative and how forward-thinking Brian was. You look at the fact that he was talking about, like, some of the social issues that he was talking about, like, in, like, you know, Teen Beat, magazine interviews you know like interviews like where it's what's your favorite color and you know he was talking about you know i mean I mean, he was talking about abortion rights and i mean he was talking about all sorts of stuff like brian was brian was was thinking very far afield and he was musically very far afield um and we'll get to we'll get to that in a little bit um a little later on in this video but uh you know he's the, and and I, I I think it I think it, it needs to be said um, I think that he is one of the um, you know he he was a staggeringly unbelievable physical presence you know I think probably the only other physical presence to rival him in 60s rock and roll well i there would be Jimi hendrix and there would be jim morrison um you know the these guys it you know it, it, brian is like sort of beyond central casting <clears throat> of what like the perfect pop star the perfect british pop star would look like um and his sense of style you know, and on one hand, I know that doesn't count, but on the other hand, um, it does count because one of the things that was cool about Swinging London, and one of the things that I always liked about learning about pe that period, but then later on, like in, in punk and post-punk, and by the time I came around, everything was anti-fashion. And like when Sonic Youth did the, what was the video that, um, what was that video? Uh, Sugarcane, uh, you know, it was I, the the or the story of Thurston showing the Mud Honey guys that video and like them kind of like raising their eyebrows, like what the hell is this, you know, uh, because everything was so anti-fashion, and you really it really was down to the Perry Farrells of the world and uh, to to create any kind of um, forward-thinking style because everything else was kind of dictated by the Black Francis's and Kim Deals and Kurt Cobain's of the world, which really was, again, anti-fashion. Though I think Kurt had style, uh, yeah, the, the red and black stripe, like, that looks fucking cool. But, um, but one of the things that's cool about Swinging London, and then again in the punk and post-punk eras, is everybody is influenced by everybody else. It's a thriving culture. It's a, it's a healthy culture and a healthy artistic culture, a healthy counterculture. Uh, so you have fashion and literature and film and graphic design and music all informing each other. And I mean, that was, you know, Sid Barrett wrote about fashion as much as he wrote about anything else. And I, you know, I always thought that that was really, really cool. And um, so, you know, Brian's sense of style, you know, Brian has like kind of the most impeccable sense of style out of any rock star ever, 
like he is swinging London. He's like the physical embodiment of swinging London, um, and especially especially in this in this era. I mean, my God! And it is interesting how the Rolling Stones, who were you know the 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 rough, gross, dirty bad boys, uh, became these fucking foppish dandies in in like a year, and they they look fucking great. Like they look so cool. So um, and became like style leaders and fashion icons. Um, it is it is it a weird transition, but. That was part of the whole thing with the Stones, and 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 as this era goes along, they just sort of keep all these other dimensions keep getting added to them. So in August of 1966, uh, back at RCA Studios in Hollywood, um, they recorded uh, the the epical um, "Have You Seen Your Mother, Baby, Standing in the Shadow" single. And the B-side is a masterpiece known as Who's Driving Your Plane? Um, now, this 45 is just some 45. I actually got this from my therapist as a gift, uh, my first therapist uh, as a gift uh, in the very late 90s. Um, I had, at that point, had never heard Who's Driving Your Plane. This I had not gotten yet because this was always a big, expensive set that was behind the glass and I just never purchased it because you know um so you know and I had hot rocks and more hot rocks and I again kind of pre-internet I didn't really put together just how many other extant songs there were so um so yeah so this single though um came with and this is again where the stones are really emerging and also uh, increasing in artfulness and the complexity and artfulness of their presentation, uh, where they really, they really are rivaling the Beatles, like where they really are starting to rival the Beatles on every, on every front, right? Um, and that was the picture sleeve that they shot, uh, a fisheye lens shot of, of the guys in their swinging London gear. Charlie always looked great. Charlie always looked cool. But the other guys really stepped it up. And and Brian, for any, for any Brian Jones fans watching this, Brian on, the, on that picture sleeve is wearing the suit. It'll, it'll be in the JPEG. You can, but uh, if, if you... If you know the suit, you like I don't even need to explain the the suit because it is the peak. I don't, I don't. I'm gonna make a really bold and sweeping claim. I don't know that there's another male that looked cooler at anything in the 20th century than Brian in that period with his hair that way, though like those cuffs, those shoes, and that suit. Like, I, I, that's about as cool and as awesome as a human being is capable of looking. Um, but, uh, you know, you look with your eyes and you don't listen to records with your eyes. So, um, the, the song was recorded uh, along with, a, again, the guys, I mean, this is August 66. This guy's ridiculously prolific. They knocked out some ungod and this was the sort of the beginning of the working methods that they would incorporate all the way up through some girls and um, you know emotional rescue and all that uh where they just would re would just record a ton of instrumentals and a ton of backing tracks just you know and just be ridiculously uh, uh prolific and um so not even really finished songs at this point but uh <laughs> but out of that came the two songs for that for that single, and um, have you seen your mother baby standing in the shadow? The other thing is the over the last couple of years during the pandemic, the the Stones. You know, I don't, I still don't quite get, especially post Alan Klein death. I still don't really get how the rights to the Abco stuff works. But they, on their official YouTube channel, they have been doing a phenomenal job of cleaning up the promotional videos and getting those out there. It's the, the Stones promotional videos from this era 
are like some of my favorite things ever. Uh, and again, back in the old days, I mean, we had to rely on really gnarly 25th generation things on VHS. Uh, you know, and everything just looked bloody awful. Um, so, you know, again, the, I supposedly there are supposedly there there are some earlier promo clips of the Stones, but uh, this is this is I think the earliest that is like available, and you know right out of the gate, I mean it, it and it basically the promo film is uh, just documenting the shooting of the sleeve. There's a couple. Um, Peter Whitehead did the did the promo film. There's uh, uh, a couple shots just of like them in New York and girls screaming and freaking out a, an amazing shot that's totally untimed to the music it's it's I love it of Mick walking down the street I guess in New York at like an arts fair and um it's just I don't know it's just the, this really cool hyper hyper real shot that looks like it's I don't know that looks like it's straight out of um, like a Fellini film or something. It's just a really, really cool shot. And then, of course, supposedly the other promo films are go down more, more go more down this road. I, um, uh, a brief clip of the band playing live and Mick jumping up in the air and then twirling, but it's all done in like super ultra slow motion. And um, so, yeah, that's like. That's a real that that apparently was what they did for like the Lady Jane promo film, but I've never seen those and I've I've looked, but like I've read descriptions of it. But I so I think like I said I think this is like the first full on one and kind of out of the gate they're already rivaling the Beatles for their promo films like they're already like neck and neck uh, you know and um, or they're it's it's already pretty kind of on the level of like the sub subterranean homesick blues promo clip or something like it's just really awesome and so anyway the song was conceived by mick as the ultimate freak out keith apparently it was the first song keith wrote music for at the piano but mick's lyrics are absolutely staggering um it it, it really is like i don't know it really it, it's it's like some weird combination of rock and roll lyric and like verse from the early 20th century like it's 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 really 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 beautifully brilliantly put together and uh mike leander did the horns it's 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 got this ridiculous sort of quasi 20s horn motif the uh and then um you know it's uh i guess brian plays piano on the on the song um and then keith keith's guitar is now up a level from in terms of its distortion and just using it as this sort of i don't know uh sonic um agent of chaos uh, especially in the fade out, you know, Keith is just hitting these, you know, maybe even like open, just open E strings on the guitar, just clanging away. Um, but it is, it is a sort of frantic double time song. And I think, you know, like I said, uh, you know, Mick meant it as like the ultimate freak out. It's the, it's the next stage of societal critique. Um, the next sort of, stage of daring uh the the pirate ship what have you got fuck you we do whatever we want thing uh that you know it 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 again tops the uh, uh 19th nervous breakdown paint it black you know this is like the next step up from that and just in term and just also in terms of just sonic invention uh, the band apparently never liked the final mix. Keith claimed they released the wrong version. Um, but I love it. I love how frantic and weird it is. I love the middle eight. The, the, with, I love when Mick's voice, when he brings his voice down and is, you know, tell me a story of how you adore me. It's just, it's, it's glorious. It's, it's just such, 
especially combined with the video and the picture sleeve, it is, this is just glorious, very high level pop art at its best. You know, the guys are, you know, they're, they're up there. They're, they're in the, you know, they're up there with, with the other, with the other greats at this point, you know? And, um, you know, it's funny because, I mean, you know, you read stuff from the 60s where the, the Stones were seen as, as somewhat retrogressive then. And that's just so untrue. They were, they were as forward-thinking as anybody, you know? And um, just incredible. And, and in some ways, the most forward-thinking. Um, the B-side has uh, Jack Nietzsche on piano again and uh, recorded at the same sessions. And that is the absolute masterpiece, Who's Driving Your Plane, one of my favorite Rolling Stones songs of all time. And I, you know, a song that was very obscure to me until, um, you know, until I got this and I was like, what the, f you know, what is this? Um, <clears throat> but it is a, so, you know, in the same way that, uh, that they prefigure the sound of punk or the sound of um, kind of lo-fi uh, bands uh, it, with their mid-60s uh, blues, blues and rock and roll covers. This, this prefigures to me um, like a lot of the sound of 90s stuff. I mean, to me, this is, this prefigures the sound of like the John Spencer blues explosion or maybe even Beck or Bjork or potentially the Beastie Boys. I, to me, it prefigures the sound of the early RZA productions, definitely uh, Old Dirty Bastard's first album. Um, it is very much using the studio as an instrument. It is a deconstructed blues, because it, it's, it's basically a blues vamp, but it's so, it's like played slightly out of time like the the it's big and echoing and crazy and weird sounding like you know it what again just using the studio as an instrument you know so i've again like i feel like that's what a lot of post-punk bands did it's the melvins would do like there's all these examples and i feel like this is one of the very first where it's like a just like where it's deconstructed and it's deconstructing itself as you're listening to it it's absolutely brilliant i think it's extremely forward thinking um and as a song uh you know i love it because i think mixed lyrics he's again going after the rich girl and but what he does with it and first of all just the sound of his voice like mick is really like on this he's like the best rock and roll singer on the planet on this i mean my god he just he sounds perfect that is how a rock and roll vocal is supposed to sound he he that that the, the again ragged pushing his voice but uh but you know it's mick and mick never fully loses it i mean because that's not what he he doesn't lose it that's not what he does um so there the, so that comes off again as is cockiness uh, or not cockiness, confidence, and uh, and just sounding sort of supremely great. And um, I love Keith's guitar stuff, um, and I love when you can tell Keith is sort of improving. Um, you know, there's there's definitely sort of a direction he goes in, and um, so I love that. And uh, and, and just those lyrics. I mean, that's, you know, that's a very, I don't know, that's a very young man's lyric uh, that where, where there's that type of, uh, I don't know, it's hard to explain. I, I, it's, it, it, the song captures a mood and attitude that I think you have when you're young and you've come into yourself. It's not the sound of coming into yourself anymore. Like you, you, 
have come into yourself and you're not suffering fools and uh and you you're starting you really do kind of now have a sense of what you're about <clears throat> and why you're about it and uh you know you're dealing with a, a woman in this you know outside of this song she may or may not have money who knows but where you're sort of you know where you're encouraging her and uh you know encouraging her towards experience and that could be that could be for positive for self-actualization or it could be for you know for everybody getting their kicks and um it's just it it the, the lyrics are, like mick is getting more and more explicit and just keeps pushing the envelope slightly further more you know and um you know the details become more detailed and they are just a great 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 set of lyrics and um yeah i love it it's perfect it is it is a great single and i said in the last video that some of the single choices didn't always have the artfulness of the beatles this is this is that's out the window they are now true true rivals uh because this is as artful uh this is as artful of a single as you can get and as perfectly realized uh as it can get what a long what a long day such a so long of a day that it feels like a week anyway um so the the rolling stones uh in august of 66 uh as i said uh recorded just kind of in the same uh way uh as aftermath they made um they now seemingly have really hit upon their studio process so at rca uh they just lay down a ton of songs and song ideas none of them are fully finished recordings but you know the 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 the, the songs are coming hard and fast and are uh you know, extremely, extremely impressive. Then in November of 66, so from November 8th to the 26th, uh, the Rolling Stones uh, went to uh, uh, Olympic Studios and then into Pi Studios. Pi was uh, mostly uh, for overdubs and uh, vocals, um, but they, they really, Put the album into shape at uh at olympic studios which they would record at a lot uh going forward uh andrew oh and glenn johns is the engineer now so the great glenn johns is you know a, a, and a very young glenn johns is is is, is, is um now uh, working the boards with andrew out of uh, out of all of that comes the uh ruby tuesday uh, uh let's spend the night together double a side and uh which i think or <clears throat> i think is it a double a side in retrospect because i think they flipped the a sides in the uk and um, and, and us i think i think one had one and one had the other i let's spend the night together first of all jagger is no longer writing direct affronts to society uh, daring its value system. Uh, what's interesting is he is now just embodying his own value system or the emerging uh, counterculture value system or reflecting what is happening directly uh, in Swinging London. And there's sort of no thought to how the, the squares are going to perceive it or be offended by it. So it does not feel like a direct, a direct dare. So that is a shift away from have you seen your mother baby in the, the 1966 singles. Um, so let's spend the night together. These, these people, you know, he's not, he's not sort of dangling it in front of you for shock value. It's these people, the, these people are living their lives in a different kind of way. So, um, it is and and part of what is so fascinating about the song is the song is driven by by three things first of all the organ part by brian is amazing because it is just 
sheer, weird, almost avant-garde, droning minimalism. Uh, I think I've never heard the isolated tracks, but if you were to isolate the tracks, maybe they're out there somewhere. Uh, I would, I would love to just hear that. I, I, I don't understand, you know, the Stones have released these deluxe packages of some of their seventies and then albums and then like tattoo you and stuff. I have no idea what the holdup is with, with s stuff from the sixties. And I will get into that later as well. But, um, but like that would be kind of cool to hear some of that some of that kind of stuff. I mean, they've they've done that to some degree with the Beatles. They've they've done that with with the Beach Boys. I mean, the Beach Boys kind of, you know, you get to listen to every single little detail with 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 um, with like the Sunshine Tomorrow package and then some of those things. Um, I wish this. I wish they would do that with the Stones. Anyway, um, so there's Brian's part, the vocal harmonies, the 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 the. the it's just such an interesting use of vocal harmonies. It's such an interesting use of back and forth. I I don't even really know what you can relate it to because it's not it's not raucous. It's not necessarily vocal. Or they're, they're backing vocals as opposed to vocal harmonies. I guess. Uh, I just I absolutely love it. Um, it's just it's such a creative use of that. And then the big thing is Charlie's drumming. Um, and I'm going to go off on something I've been thinking about for years. I think one of the big differences, or people have compared many times the differences between Lennon McCartney and Jagger Richards, or, you know, there's, and there's a lot of Beatles versus Stones stuff. Um, but it's interesting because people rarely ever pick, Ringo against Charlie. And there's rarely ever a discussion about who's the better drummer. And I dare say, and, and if somebody is like a, a musicologist or is a musician out there who's watching this, they might think that this is complete, completely nonsensical and that I'm completely wrong. I'm, I'm willing to be wrong. I don't give a shit. So, you know, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Who cares? So, uh, won't be the first or the last time. So, I think this is my sort of half cocked sort of non musician theory is that Ringo and Charlie play completely different functions within their respective bands. And that is a lot of that is actually down to the songwriting and down to the material. I will explain. I think that the Lennon McCartney songs uh, Paul by design, John, because John just had such a weird crazy sense of rhythm. I mean, John is like closer to John Lee Hooker than he is. I mean, John was not a human metronome. I mean, he was, he, you know, and, and he would poke fun at himself about that. But like, I love that. I love that his time signatures are so weird and he goes in and out of time. Like, I love that. Like, I'm super into that. Um, but, you, you know, I think Paul did it to sort of be creative and clever. And, and between the two of them, you have this kind of perfect combination of intention and uh, 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 intuition, you know? So, but the Beatles songwriting has so much, or has so many dynamics built into it. So whether it's tempo shifts or different parts, uh, different elements that are contrasting, uh, the, w the way the bridge, the way they wrote bridges really being songs within the songs, all of that stuff, you know, the, 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 the all the dynamics are in the songs already right and uh, like hardwired in and so ringo's function in the band is to serve as like the foundation of the house and then they build on top of him right so even when they're playing live it's all it's always on ringo's shoulders i feel like it's not for like it's no coincidence that he later on, like in the 90s and 2000s, he would joke that I'm the drum machine. Fun fact about the Beatles, uh, in Mark Lewison's Sessionography book, I want to say the the number of times a take broke down because of Ringo was because Ringo made a mistake was like four. Like it was some, I want to say it was like under five. Like the guy just didn't make mistakes. He just, he, he would lock in and do, and 
and they could do whatever they needed to do because they knew that, that he was always going to be absolutely rock solid. Charlie, the, the Stones' songwriting style, especially with Keith, and especially as Keith becomes more modal and then moves into the Nashville thing, and because they are so much more kind of ultimately blues-based, um, and ultimately, you know, it, it, they really are coming from the sort of John Lee Hooker, Robert Johnson thing, right? Um, the songwriting is a lot more linear and a lot more straightforward. And what that does with Charlie, especially given Charlie as, a, as a, a, an aspiring jazz drummer earlier in life, is they don't build on, on top of Charlie. Charlie drives the band. He drives the band in a completely different way. Like, Ringo trying to drive the Beatles would sound absurd. Charlie driving the Stones is the dynamic. The idea that, that so many of their songs start with a Keith intro and then Charlie sort of takes hold of the rhythm and, and goes from there. And that, that sort of trade-off or that very quick baton passing from Keith to Charlie and, you know, Keith setting the tempo, but then Charlie commanding it. I think that Charlie leads the dynamics of the band. And I think this is maybe my single favorite performance of everything he ever did. This, the way he plays on Let's Spend the Night Together is like virtuoso genius stuff. Like listen to every single downbeat, listen to every single fill, listen to how he speeds up slightly, listen to how he really leans in when they go into the chorus. Like. It's it's all subtle. He's not doing flashy, crazy Keith Keith Moon stuff or Ginger Baker stuff, but but the command of the dynamics is all from him. The 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 Stones, you know, the Beatles used Ringo to build cathedrals. Charlie uses the Stones as like a jaguar. <laughs> <laughs> just and just drives them around winding winding roads at high speeds with uh in the middle of the night. He's you know so what Ringo does is amazing. I'm one, I'm a very very big Ringo fan. I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm saying that they serve two entirely different functions in their bands. They are, it is two totally different schools of thought and um two totally different methodologies. And what Charlie does on this song is like f like fucking unbelievable it's i it's it's one of my favorite things to listen to basically i could i could listen and i have i could listen to it just for like a half hour straight and just listen to the f the 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 command of this guy and again not doing anything super obvious or like oh my god listen to that that's un like you know the way a keith moon ginger baker mitch mitchell john bonham uh, commands your attention at times, like nothing like that. But goddamn, it's it's unbelievable, unbelievable stuff. Uh, it's like top level rock and roll drumming of all time, as far as I'm concerned. And then you have, and then you have Mick, and Mick is Mick is amazing. This is like one of the best vocal performances of his life. It's an amazing set of lyrics because it's all suggestion, just enough, just enough details. Uh, to both to both set the scene and suggest the the attitude and ideology around it, brilliant. I mean, and 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 also the when it slows down in the middle and then and then kicks back up for that that and and the organ swell and the the excitement and the 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 the, the, the it's not the climax because it's 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 all this amazing setup for that last verse that doesn't happen to me every day and just the the sheer like the band playing as one and excitement and and sense of anticipation uh about this night that they're gonna spend together it just it all it all works beautifully god damn it what a masterful masterful recording my god what a great band i mean like this is why they're so revered you know what i mean like this is like Amazing, amazing, amazing. And, you know, out 
they're kind of just outgunning pretty much all of their peers <laughs> at this point, you know? Because, uh, I mean, it's just an extraordinary, extraordinary song, especially to have as a single in 1967. Um, at the beginning of 1967, too. Um, and, then, and, then there's, and then there's Ruby Tuesday. Ruby Tuesday, apparently Keith wrote the lyrics. Uh, Mick, according to Mick, he had nothing to do with the lyric writing, which is interesting, because you could see... You could see this as a Mick character study, um, and you could see this as a as an interesting sort of other side to to uh, to what Mick was doing at this point. But no, he did he did not write the words. Apparently, it's all Keith, which is amazing. Um, musically, uh -huh. apparently, this was a Keith Bryan co write, or depending on 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 who you listen to, a Bill Wyman. Brian co-write. Um, either way, apparently, uh, Brian got screwed. Um, the other thing is, uh, is apparently it originated from Brian, and and then there was and then there was nothing. So um, you know, you can kind of call this a Brian Keith collaboration. Maybe Bill's in there somewhere. Um, Brian plays the. Brian plays the recorder. I think it is absolutely gorgeous. I love the recorder part parts uh, because it's a few different sections, and as melodic counterpoints, as just as just an idea, the idea that that you can take a, a, a an instrument as sort of kind of flimsy sounding as a recorder, and and uh, have it be just such a sound, just this the sound of the sunrise. It's gorgeous, and what Brian does with it, I, I just absolutely love it. It's a, it's a little sloppy, but that's also endearing. Um, the other thing is, so there are photos, and I was I'm gonna get to this book anyway. I might as well bring it up there. So this is this is a book called The Early Stones. For this I got this in the '90s. Um, it's one of my favorite books ever. It is photos by the great Michael Cooper, who did the artwork well, for Satanic Majesties. But it really, it captures the stones. So here is Brian recording the recorder parts for Ruby Tuesday. But, uh, but it captures, um, among many other things, uh, I mean, the, the in-the-studio photos are, are incredible. But, but there are these photos here of Brian playing the, the double bass for, uh, for Ruby Tuesday. As Keith notes, um, uh, uh, Brian on cello, this, this is Keith, I'm quoting, Brian on cello at Olympic Studios recording Ruby Tuesday, even though he didn't end up playing cello, Bill and I played it. It took the two of us to play it. We found out if you're not actually a cello player, it takes at least two guys to play the thing. Um, so it is, it is in fact Bill, uh, Bill and Keith, who who play the who play the double bass of a cello, and uh, what's interesting is I guess one would do the fingerings and one would do the the use the bow <laughs> across it, and that part that they that they jointly do is again, what a cool weird droning part. So you, the idea that you have Brian on organ on the A side. Or, and, or they're, well, they're both A-sides, but the, the idea that you have these two contrasting, like, drone pieces that are happening kind of opposite the songs, you know, that's, I love that. And I love that then, that it's this double A-side. That, to me, I had said in the last video that sometimes the Stones lack the artfulness of the Beatles. This is the artfulness of the Beatles. That is Beatles-level stuff. I love that. It's brilliant. These guys. So, and 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 also one other thing about Ruby Tuesday is I know that it gets uh, back to the Rolling Stone album guide and beyond that. You know, people talk about it in terms of being uh, their most Beatlesque song. Maybe, but I, I don't know. I, I what Beatles song sounded like it? It it almost prefigures something like Hello Goodbye to me. It's. Uh, I just think it's a forward-thinking, absolutely gorgeous, melodic wonder with this great cello, weird, droning thing, 
you know, kind of emerging and, the, you know, and, and then receding uh, with the counterpoint of the rising sunshine sort of butterflies in the in the morning sky uh, recorder parts. And then and then Mick just sings it perfectly. Like what a magnificent, totally sublime song and single. These guys are operating at top, top level. It's magnificent, utterly magnificent. So, uh, so yeah, so <laughs> moving right along. So, um, and this is where the, this is where uh, the next album, um, Between the Buttons, truly comes into, comes into being. Um, and this is, this is the, uh, this is the American version, uh, of course, because I live in America. And as you can see, this album has been around, uh, been been around. Uh, I got the. I mean, there's no dust sleeve. I got I got this in, I don't know, late '90s, early 2000s, somewhere in there. Uh, my my uh, my ex-wife had uh, this kind of little. It was almost like a kid's record player that she had. There was a there was a brief period in the two thousands where that was sort of in vogue, um, where you would see you would see them for for sale. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where the, the top would lift up. Anyway, uh, I used to listen to this while at night, uh, not uh, trying to wake her up or anything. I would listen to this at, at low volume. Uh, but th this vinyl copy is not the the greatest. Um, the U.S. sequence, to my mind, in the in the way you know you can, in the way that you can, very definitively make an argument for for the U.S. sequence of aftermath, and the Stones themselves seem to think that that is the now the can canonical sequence. Um, <clears throat> the U.S. sequence of uh, between the buttons, forget about it. Uh, this is the U.K. Does it say, yeah, it says UK right there. I don't know if you can make that out. Um, so this is, this is what I have been listening to all these, all these years. This was the last album of the sixties of theirs that I ever heard. Um, I just could never find a copy of this damn thing. Um, and when I was very young, I actually kind of thought that it was like a, like a compilation almost like I didn't I didn't even fully put together that it was uh like when I was 12 I didn't even fully put together that it was like a real album I thought it was almost like a hodge kind of a flowers flowers e December's children e kind of hodgepodge neither fish nor fowl record um and it so so I didn't get the full I didn't fully absorb this until the early 2000s and um, what a revelation, what a revelation it was, truly. And so, um, so the UK sequence to me is the only one that matters. Uh, it, there's no question. I mean, there's just no question. The US version, for, forget it. it yeah. So anyway, and, and does, oh God, I think the Stones go US version on this one too. Why? Why? It doesn't make any goddamn sense. So the single came out like, a week before the album, kind of, so, kind of in the, you know, kind of in the way that, like, the the standalone single preceding the album by a week, I think, uh, I, I want to say the Beatles had done something similar, did, did We Can Work It Out, Day Tripper come out on the same day as Rubber Soul? It might have. So, that was, that was an interesting, um, excuse me, development in, in the British Invasion bands of, that um, that the next standalone single would tie would tie in with the LP as the LP was becoming an emerging art form in its own right, um, but uh, and the other thing about this album, you know, the, the Stones were were recording, um, you know, late night sessions. Uh, they were they really had come into their own. They are you know, fully confident, they, you know, they are fully, fully actualized as this amazing band and as the pop heathens. And this album cover, I mean, my God, this album cover 
I I think this is like one of the greatest album covers ever. I am absolutely obsessed with this album cover. Um, and you can obviously see it better here. Uh, the guy who took the cover of uh, UK Out of Our Heads slash December's Children, uh, Jared Mankiewicz, uh, took took this shot. It is, I mean, I, Jesus Christ. I mean, the attitude, the attitudes of all of these men. Uh, Charlie, uh, you probably already know this, Charlie named the album uh, Between the Buttons was British slang for it. We're not really sure yet. Charlie had asked Andrew Lou Goldham, what's the name of the album? He said it's Between the Buttons. So Charlie said, well, that's what we should call the album. And then drew the drew the cartoon on the back, thus explaining it. Uh, um, I love the cartoon. I love that, you know, the Stones are now taking charge, or, you know, of the album packaging. So the idea that you would have the back of the album uh, where it's this cartoon drawn by the drummer, um, you know, they're, they're, they, are, they are fully masters of their destiny at this point. And uh, so... The other thing I will say, and you can see this on this photo as well, um, where Brian looks far more engaged as opposed to... I, what did the, the guy, the old God's Nearly Dead, uh, but said, said that Brian looked like a, like a wounded... What did it, it was like, like a... Like a well, what was the animal? Damn it. Like a wounded albino mole seeking shelter. I, it's some really unflattering description. But the, these photos, the Jared Mankiewicz, Mankiewicz uh, I forget the name of the park in London. Is it Hyde Park in London? Maybe. I don't know. But, but, uh, but this was just immediately following a recording session. Just the idea that this is what they looked like coming out of the studio at whatever, you know, five or six in the morning. Uh, th there's just the power of these images. The rest of the Jared Mankiewicz photos, they are out there on the internet. Um... I don't know. The photos are kind of as good as the album. Like, there's, like, I feel like this tells the story of swinging London. Like this, some somewhere between, you know, I, I don't want to name everything, but somewhere between, like, if you look at these photos and watch the blow up, you get a really good idea, I think, of what swinging London must have been like. Um, and, you know, so anyway, uh, I absolutely love this album, and um, we, you know, we're just gonna, we're just gonna get into it, man. Um, I think that not a lot of people love this album. Uh, Mick, uh, you know, I, it's interesting when when a, when an artist puts their own work down, how much that informs the public's view of it. Uh, Mick has never been kind about this album. I think the only song he said he liked on it was Backstreet Girl. And he started putting it down early. I mean, he started putting it down in the 68 Rolling Stone interview. Um, Keith famously has never liked the production on this. I mean, this is a constant thing during the Andrew years. Um, and uh, and critics have never particularly liked it. They, you know, uh, the, the most common thing is that it's unstones-like, it's uh, it's either too Beatles or too Kinks, too Twee, too Musical. Uh, why are the Stones doing Musical? Uh, you know, I remember re reading a scathing review uh, in one of those British, either Mojo or Uncut, or even it might have been Q, where they were like, by the time the Kazoos show up, you you, you want to take the record off the turntable, like you know. Um, but I think, you know, to me, um, the Stones were, especially Mick, I mean, these guys were dedicated followers of fashion, <laughs> to always, I mean, to some degree. And um, we're going to get into, we're going to get, get into the, uh, the unstones-ness of, wow, of this, but is, or, or, or is it, or is it not? Um... I love the production, and I will, uh, as we as we go through, I will explain probably in laborious, uh, endless detail why I love the production, and I bet you can't wait to hear that. Uh -huh. So, um, so let us let us just um, jump right in. Um, as I'm gonna say, I in my in 
to my way of thinking, this is as much of a masterpiece as Aftermath. These, like I said, from Aftermath, from 66 to 73, like I said um, in, the, in the last video, all of these records play as novels or films. So, and uh, this is a crucial part um, of this album, or of this, of this period. Uh, the one other thing I will say is part of, a big part of my affection for this record, because I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Other than the birds, um, especially the second half of the 60s, um, every album, you don't have sort of in-between albums. Like, each album by any of the major people, whether it's Jimi Hendrix or Dylan or, or whoever, it, uh, from the 60s, each album is a major, is like the next major statement, right? So that's how Cream's catalog goes through. That's how, like, that's how a lot of people, the only, the only time there almost was sort of like an in-between album would have been if the Beatles actually had gotten Get Back finished in between the White Album and then Abbey Road, right? Um, but the, the Birds, I don't know if that was contractual, like the Birds, put albums out at such a crazy rate. Um, it's, it's kind of mind boggling to, to think about how, like, I mean, it was like two or three a year, just year after year after year. So like I said, I don't know if that was Columbia records kind of mandating that, but, um, but given the birds crazy genre jumping, I, I can't imagine that Columbia would have dictated that. Um, so I, who knows, but the, um, you almost, you know, even, even like, um, the Beach Boys going from today to party to summer days, summer nights, I think that's the sequence. Um, even those all sort of feel like deliberate statements, even though they are all very kind of divergent and different from each other. And I know some people think that party, does party, or does party post-date summer days? And not? No. Anyway, but you get what I'm saying. It's party is, is a kind of a weird odd man out in the overall mid sixties arc of the beach boys, but yet it's still as much of a sort of Brian mastermind project as everything else they were doing. What I find so interesting about Between the Buttons is it really, the album un unintentionally really is what it says. It's, it's sort of between statements. You, in kind of the greater Stone story, it, it jumps from, I think, it jumps from the aftermath period to Satanic Majesties. And this is this weird amorphous phase of theirs. And like I said, and I think critically it's been treated that way. So I... You know, I really want to like get into this record because I, um, I love that a band with that major of a stature. Um, I mean, to me, it would be like if the Beatles had an album between Revolver and Sgt. Pepper's. You know, um, so I that's uh, I think one of the big things that I find very very endearing about this record is that they were so prolific. It's almost like an unreleased album or something. It's almost like unreleased studio sessions except it, it, or or like one of the mid 80s Prince projects that he just shelved and it kind of slightly breaks your brain to think wait, this would have come in between like or this would have post dated parade but pre dated like so, um, but the fact that it is a, a real album, like it's this real thing that you can, that you can listen to anytime you like is glorious. So enough of my yakking, we'll now get into a different type of, uh, talking. Huh. Anyway, uh, the first, uh, the first song is, uh, Yesterday's Papers. And yesterday's papers, we've got, uh, and, and I really want to focus on this because not only is the Stone studio process really, like, set at this point, um, the, like, this is what works for them, and this just sort of, he these, these big prolific drops of material um, in very concentrated sessions. Uh, so we not only have that, but then we have uh, Brian... Um, 
really expanding his role as, uh, to use the phrase from the last video, this, as the Sonic Avatar. So uh, yesterday's papers, uh, Brian is uh, now off the marimba and the the, the the instrument that he's all about on this record is the vibraphone, which I'm a big vibraphone fan. So uh, someday when I review, uh, what's my man's name, Johnny Ace, I, I, I'll, I will go on and on and on at length about the the, the beauty of the vibraphone. One of the great, kind of kind of like the dulcimer, one of the great, or the harpsichord, one of the great underappreciated instruments, I think. Um, anyway, yesterday's papers, basically Mick took the, the, the line from uh, Out of Time and turned, you're obsolete, and turned that into a song. Um, it, 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 it takes that sentiment and, and just expands it. Uh, the, the vibraphone part is absolutely gorgeous and just dances around the main melody. This is a very, and I, I realize that this may be unintentional because the, the band wasn't pleased with how the album sounded. Um, however, uh, they've never gone back and remixed it. And ultimately, you know, it is the finished article and you do have to some degree uh you have to to some degree read intentionality into it because it's the it's the finished product so the production of this album i'm a really big fan of because it is a completely unique production in that all of the instruments are sort of foregrounded differently uh across the stereo picture it's it, it is it, it is a weird it's a really weird mix and, but I really like that. I like how kind of strangely stylized it is. It's almost like, you know, as opposed to it being like a, like a, like a film, uh, you know, like Aftermath, let's say, would be like a film. This is almost like a, <clears throat> you know, that like, this is, this is almost like a, made on like a sound stage or something. And it has, it's clearly incorporating false fronts and they're like the you know there are lighting cues to indicate where the camera should go so it's almost so it would be the difference between like something that's shot on location versus something that's shot on a sound stage and uh and it is it feels heavily heavily stylized as a result but i really like that and i find that a, a very unique production on one hand, it doesn't highlight them as a band, and it certainly doesn't do much in the way of portraying them like rocking, right? But what it does is it highlights how great they are uh, as musicians individually, perhaps. And, um, and I think that there are still enough band moments that it, it carries it off. So, so I'm... You know, I like the weird production of this record. I'm I'm a very big fan of it. And there's not another record that sounds like it. The only the only other album that really sounds like this, I I would say, would be the Kinks is something else. Um, but there's not yeah, there's not really much else like it. But yesterday's papers, I uh, I love the I love the weird vocal harmonies. I love Again, I just, I love how kind of mismatched it all is and how different things are in the foreground at different times. I think that, um, you know, I think that the, the sort of weird washed out guitar break is really cool. Oh, uh, Jack Nietzsche is on harpsichord on this. Um, but I love what Keith does on guitar. I love the, I love the vocal harmonies. Mick is, um... You know, I think it's just a, t a, 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 a kind of an update of what he was doing on Aftermath. It's time and space, states of mind, fleeting states of mind of of youth, of somebody of somebody who is living very quickly and really is living in the moment and really is kind of on top of their youth. And again, starting to become newly affluent and... Uh, having access to crazy experiences and new and exciting experiences as swinging London is really, really swinging. So, um, it's, it's a cool brief 
because it's just like two minutes or something. It's a really cool brief, just like introductory, it, it, it comes and goes uh, song. And um, I think it sets up the album perfectly, um, especially uh, in light of the next song, uh, which is um, My Obsession. And so one of the things that is cool about this record, and I think maybe... Uh, along with the production is kind of off-putting to people is there's a lot of they're they're very like asymmetrical arrangements right so there's a lot of weird drum breaks there's a lot of stop start and my obsession um my obsession especially is like that so um and then it very like quickly lurches back into form and then quickly goes back out of form. Um, again, you have weird, cool, washed out harmonies that I'm, uh, that I'm a really big fan of. And also, you know, this is where Mick is really now even like he, Mick just keeps becoming more Mick with, with each album at this point. So the idea that, that, that he's now writing about my obsession, which is something that this particular obsession will now carry through for the, most of uh, most songs, you know, or, or most of the albums that he will write for the bulk of his life and for a lot of people will become one of the defining features of, of his, uh, of his uh, public, um, you know, of, of his public face. Uh, you know, he's he's kind of uh, 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 owning up to it all right here and just, you know, again, referring to it as an obsession. And um, it's just, it's, it's a weird, it's, it's a weird song and uh, I absolutely love it. And I think, and also the, the, who, who does the, is Nietzsche on the, no, that's Stuart, Ian Stewart on, uh, the second stone, or <laughs> I guess, uh, Ian, Ian Stewart is, is on the piano and a brilliant, brilliant piano part. It's this weird needling tension creating piano. Uh, it is, and, and, uh, Brian is on organ and also contributes in a different way to the, to the, uh, if, if, if Ian Stewart is providing tension, Brian is providing roiling anxiety under the surface. It's, it's amazing. And it's also an amazing just piece of, again, back to Aftermath, Jagger method acting. It's a great song. And again, just like yesterday's paper, is very, very brief. They go by like super quick and they're almost like set up tracks, right? They're, they're sort of, manic and quick cutting and they're building to something what are they building to well they are building to one of the greatest songs the, the one that mick likes off this record they are building to an absolute masterpiece backstreet girl um backstreet girl um again this would be um this would be another Ray Davies esque, um, you know, kind of like a end of the season or one of those. Um, but Mick does such a great job of inhabiting this character, this this worn out, uh, uh, hard boiled aristocrat. I I have often thought about this song in the context of like, um, if you've ever seen the film Scandal. The, the the from 1990 one of the greatest movies ever made Bridget Fonda's in it um here we are scandal if you've ever seen this movie it's about the Perf perfumo uh John perfumo scandal uh with Christine Keeler uh so who's um, Ian McKellen so John hurt Joanne Wally uh Ian McKellen and Bridget Fonda this is one of the best movies ever this is just like oh my god I absolutely love this film I've always loved this film uh but you know, I feel like Mick is writing from a Profumo-esque, hard-boiled, you know, old-school English conservative Tory uh, point of view. And um, this is one of the greatest pieces of vocal method acting. This song is 
like, is this the best song they had written up to this point? Uh, maybe. Uh, it is It is absolutely a stunning piece of writing. Um, and, and also the way Mick sings it, because there are moments when he's saying, like, especially the way he sings the chorus, like, or, or, you know, uh, just be my backstreet girl. Like, there's there's moments of you can um, you can picture this you can picture this this hard boiled crusty old bastard you know with brill creamed hair uh, and and thick horn rimmed glasses you you can picture him laying on his back you know in his in, you know with with the socks with the weird I, what, I don't even know what those things are called but I always feel like old British men are wearing those things over their socks you know what I'm talking about I don't know what those are uh, you know and you can picture him like laying like you know on a uh, on a chaise lounge in some uh, you know uh, very upscale hotel room having this clandestine affair with this with this young thing and Almost kind of in the same way of like, you know, the, 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 the Jackson Pollock movie. What's my man's name? Ed, uh, oh Christ. I can't think of the guy's name, the actor, you know, he's awesome. The Pollock movie. It's incredible. Where like at the end, like he's an old nasty drunk and he's got, is it Jennifer Connelly? And like, there's these sort of moments where he's like really taken with her. Like she kind of almost brings him back to life. For a second, you kind of see the humanity in this guy, and then it very quickly goes away and gets very dark again. Like, you can totally picture this, like, nasty, like, MP, you know, on the chaise lounge, like, in his boxers, like, you know, one leg draped over, the bottle of the champagne, the ice has melted, and he's, like, addressing this girl. And for, like, these very brief moments, her, her youthfulness and her beauty and her innocence like brings him back to life and he and he almost seems like a person he almost seems human and and then and then no 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 it's right back to the to the awful classist nastiness um people have said or have pointed to the to this song as being the stones being sexist right that's one of the tropes that gets bandied about i I honestly, I think this song is is proto feminist. I don't. In what world do you listen to this asshole and his manipulations of this girl and think, hell yeah, like again, kind of like with Under My Thumb, except this time, like Under My Thumb is played for dark laughs. This is a this is a this is a tragedy. And it's it's an incredible tragedy. You feel you feel the weight of the, the the class structure. You feel the weight that you know for some people London is not swinging, uh, and you feel awful for this girl. It's I I don't I don't know how um, I just don't know how you could interpret this as woman hating. It's entirely sympathetic. It's entirely sympathetic to the to the girl who's having the affair. Maybe she works at a nightclub. Maybe she's hooking on the side. Maybe, you know, she, 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 she came from down from the North or something and she's out of her element and she's being talked to like, she's, you know, like, like a nothing. It, it and the nest and, and also, so Brian plays, Brian plays, Brian plays the vibraphone. A guy by the name of Nick DeCaro plays the accordion. These elements, along with Keith's acoustic guitar, these elements create such unbelievably beautiful, brilliant swells of absolute melodic grace that it 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 highlights the nastiness and the wretchedness of the character that Mick is portraying. So and 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 the thing uh, and it's the, the 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 melodic beauty is as melodic and beautiful as the middle section of Lady Jane, uh, except this is now kind of another layer of sophistication because it's pitted against just this absolutely v kind of vile uh, you know piece of work 
um, that, you know, are like, like the upper crust bastards in this film, you know, amazing. It's amazing. It's, it's one of the greatest songs ever written. It's one of the greatest vocal performances of all time. Mick was running the ink. I don't know what to say, you know? So after Backstreet Girl, we, we kind of change scenes immediately and go into Connection. And Connection is often written about uh, as being Keith's kind of first lead vocal. Really, it's, it's sort of a, a, it's really a duet with Mick. Um, it is, uh, it's the first sort of straight ahead rock and roll song. I don't, I don't think Brian plays on this one at all. I think, is this the first time then? Well, I don't know. There might be a couple things on Aftermath, but, but this is, this is Keith doing what Keith is going to do as the sixties go on, where he's covering all the guitar parts and he's just multi, he's simply multi-tracking himself, uh, perfectly. Um, the song is so interesting and to, again, to me, very, very swinging London. Um, it is, it's weirdly a song of social protest. It is also weirdly a song about someone turning away from society uh, or wanting to, you know, delve into their own internal world. There's a lot of drug songs in rock and roll especially, you know, from like the 60s onwards. I think that this is one of the very best. I think that this is one of the very best uh, depictions of that mentality and the sort of the, the itching uh, hyperactivity to detach, um, to f gain some sort of sense of control of, some, uh, of, some, of a person's interior world via... Uh, creating a barrier. Uh, the barrier in this case is I'm doing this and you aren't. Or, um, and uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's just it is it is an it is an amazing amazing song. The lyrics make allusions to was was Pilcher around? I think I think Pilcher. Yeah, no, Pilcher totally would have would have been busting people by this point. So it has it it, it has a very kind of of the moment. Uh, uh, feel it and is just super immediate. It is, um, yeah, the just the urgency, the the fact that there's a weird melancholia or plaintiveness underneath the urgency, uh, all all put together is just a great rock and roll song, a great catchy rock and roll song. Uh, Again, for, for Mick and Keith as rock and roll writers in the world's greatest rock and roll band, they're they're again they're they're going up a level and uh, it's imbued so strongly with their own sensibilities. Um, you know, the idea of a song having social protest or political ramifications from people who sound like they cannot be bothered to do such a thing um, is especially for early for late 1966 the fact that they're that that they're already at that point and and you know it hasn't even gotten to some of the big defining moments of the 60s yet like no wonder these are the guys who went on to do gimme shelter you know what i mean and and then went on to do you know uh sticky fingers or exile on main street or something so um so, you know, we, we, we come from the beauty slash ugliness juxtaposition of Backstreet Girl into this, this weird or pained urgency. And then, and then, and then we, and then there's melodic, like complete melodic perfection and beauty with the next song. And that is, uh, of course, She Smiled Sweetly. And I'm actually going to say that I don't think that this is Mick method acting. Um, I think this is the real Mick. I, I think that this is the, this next song is She Smiled Sweetly. Like the last video, used to great effect in a Wes Anderson movie. This, of course, was in, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, oh, my God, not the Magnificent Ambersons. Obviously, that's, well, what are they called? Anyway, you know the movie. It's... You know, you know what it is. I, I, I just can't think of the name of the damn thing, but you've, I'm sure you've seen it. 
I can't believe I'm blanking on it, but uh, we've got to keep things moving here. So she smiled sweetly. Um, she smiled sweetly is like this song is as much of it's as much as it's part of the album. It is it's it is its own world. It's like it's like I don't know. This song could be an album unto itself almost. It's so intimate and hyper focused and all it's all super super tight close-ups and I talked a little bit about in terms of aftermath um the sort of firelit beauty um this is definitely sitting by the fire at night you know with with a person that you are just enraptured with uh I think it's one of the best love songs ever written. Mick sings it up in his higher uh, in his higher register without going into falsetto. It is one of the most open-hearted, I think, earnest, I think, gorgeous songs, and just about you know the healing, the 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 healing of power of love. As cornball as that sounds, that's what this is. And sometimes, and God damn it, we all need it. As cornball as that sounds, you know, it, 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 when it's there for you, it is a lifesaver. And it's also in a, in a, in a way, especially because I think that this would have been written about Mary and faithful. I think there's a few portraits of Mary and faithful from this time because Mick was now dating her. Uh, and they were this sort of super couple in swinging London. Um, Tell you, I'd be writing songs about Marianne Faithful too. God damn. Anyway, but uh, huh. but um, you know, the idea you can just picture. There's not a promotional film for this, but you can picture it in your head because they would be sitting by a fire and it would be close-ups of her face and then close-ups of Mick and like you, you can you can picture it and it's it's again it's just it is so earnest and so beautiful and that this woman has is so genuinely caring and um just this is Mick uses no R&B or soul inflections and yet this is his most soulful singing <laughs> uh it's not informed by anything other than his own emotions this is magnificent top layer stuff um like you know, to me, this is why the stones are the stones, right? The other thing about this, uh, there are two things. Um, it is, uh, it, it is uh, open for debate as to whether uh, Keith or Brian uh, played the organ. The organ part is one of the most beautiful uh, droning. Here she is. Here's our little insect killer. She hasn't been in a video in a while. Say hello to YouTube, honey. Yeah, hello. She she killed an ant. She took out an ant earlier, and then she took out a fly. She's just been she's just been a scrappy hunting machine up there. That's right. Showing them who's boss. Not taking taking no shorts. Okay, she wants to get down. Right, bye, dear. Anyway, um, <laughs> but um, where the hell was I? My God. Uh, th but the the lurching, droning, minimalist organ part is, and again, because everything is so close mic'd, and because this whole thing is intimate, and all the all the instrumental elements are intimate, and the lyric is intimate, and the performance is intimate. Everything is everything is is just that that hyper real, romantic, just infatuation, enraptured thing. Um, that 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 droning organ it it underpins the state of anxiety that Mick is singing about that that she sort of helps him through um it it doesn't read as melancholic it reads as just again the emotional underpinning and um i am going to say between the hyper intimate uh, miking of everything and the foregrounding of individual elements at the same time and droning weird dark droning organ juxtaposed beautiful beautiful melodic soulful singing 
I am going to say that this song, because we know he was obsessed with them and we know he loves certain songs on this album, I am going to say that this is the influence influence on what Brian Wilson did with Smiley Smile, after he scrapped Smile and went to Smiley Smile and then went to Wild Honey. I'm going to say that I'm calling it that influence starts here. Bam, bam. So um, the other thing, not only the organ, which is the which would be the co-star of the film, right? If Mick is Orson Welles, the organ is Joseph Cotton, right? Like right right there behind him, like just as awesome, you know? But the other coast the other co-star, the Agnes Moorhead, I suppose, would be would be Charlie's drums. G- gentle but steady emotional reality, the perfect anchor, you know, the perfect anchor to the whole thing. Charlie's drums, this is one of the some of the best drumming Charlie ever did. Um, it's the it's a world away from Get Off of My Cloud, you know? Uh, and it's so musical and absolutely gorgeous. And 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 he truly, he, he, he grounds the entire thing. Magnificent. So where do you go after she smiled sweetly? Like what what do you do, right? We get to the we get to the, the, the side ender, um, and that is uh, Cool, Calm, and uh, Collected, which is a song that a lot of people really don't like. I love it. I, I've always liked this song. One of the things that I think is cool about this song is this is, you started to hear a little bit of this on Aftermath, but now it, it, it starts to become a growing theme. The, the, the Keith Richards writing style, he hasn't gone like Nashville tuning yet, but the weird sort of, I don't even know, like, I don't know if he was screwing around with the different tunings yet, but it feels like modal writing. I'm not a musicologist, so I can't say, but the sort of weird, loose, open-ended, you could kind of affix any parts to this uh, style, the the stuff that he does, if, you know, when you watch One Plus One, where Keith is sort of leading th- these um, very kind of open-ended jams, and it's loosely melodic, it's almost Middle Eastern um, sounding, um, just kind of using harmonies, and it, but it's all kind of off, like, just like one or two strings. Like, that sort of style that just becomes so central to what Keith does on this and the next several records. Like, there's the the beginnings of it on Aftermath, but this is, like, where it's, like, really noticeable you know this is like where it's it's taking taking shape and so i love i love keith's guitar stuff on this and um and the song is loose and chaotic enough to to give space to him to to experiment with that so i love it uh brian uh is the one who does the kazoo solo again i i this is swinging London shit. Like I don't have a like I don't have a problem with this. And and you know the Beatles hadn't done this much of a knees up at this point. I guess Yellow Submarine would be the closest. But um, but I I just really like that the Stones are that fully committed to this sort of I don't know the the sort of the period pastiche and the kind of sending up of the past that that inhabited you know the the the, the sarcastic wise ass thing uh kind of underneath uh um you know some of the attitudes of swinging london and 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 also that it that it you know there was the sort of al capone chic of the time and that this does have kind of like a weird vaguely ragtime 20s thing too um I love it. I love that it's this weird combination of ragtime and a British hall kind of knees up, uh, and you've got the weird rock and roll thing happening with Keith. You like, I love it. And as a as a uh, another portrait, I'm gonna say I'm gonna read intention into it and say the, a, a portrait of Marianne. What what a what a f- sort of funny tongue in cheek, but also really cool um, portrait of her. You know, and a a multi-dimensional, ethereal yet super real woman who's who's being written about here. It's a cool. I don't know if if some. You know, 
I, I, I hope she was flattered by the song, because I think it's a very flattering song. And it, But it comes from such a sort of a cockeyed angle, and especially coming after She Smiled Sweetly. I love it. And I also love the frantic uh, uh, sp speeding up and just going into noise and chaos at the end. I also love that because it serves as a very, very, very effective side ending. Uh, it's a perfect side ending, which shows that the Stones are like beautifully crafting their albums at this point, and they're, they're thinking about those things uh, because it's perfect sequencing. So, uh, so with that, uh, we, we flip the record over. All right, so side two of Between the Buttons. Um, so begins with um, All Sold Out. Uh, kind of back to the more fragmentary songs uh, on side one. Um, but, uh, and who's... Yeah, so... All Sold Out is an interesting one because it sounds like, and maybe in, in this case, the production could have been more dynamic um, and the foregrounding of Mick and everything. Maybe this works against it because if you listen behind the vocals, it's really a loose, amazing jam. It's almost like two things at once. It's almost like like a cool rock and roll song that has a that has a really good groove and kind of smart biting lyrics from from Mick. Um behind all of that, there's a hell there's like a hell of a party going on. So Brian is on recorder, just sort of flying all over the place. And who's on the So Bill is playing organ. That's fucking nuts. <laughs> and uh, Keith uh, is on the backing vocals. It is, I love this song. It sort of starts with the fade-in, so in the same way that the that side one ends with the big crash, this kind of fades in. It, you know, again, album sequencing, they're doing a beautiful job. Mick sing, you know, Mick sounds great. Um, but I, I could see why you know, um, a different mix would be, you know, uh, maybe more, more people could appreciate the song because there is, uh, as much as there's a great groove, there is a looseness and a wildness happening that, uh, is awesome. It's like a party's happening in the other room or something. Um, and, and I guess that party comes into full, full bore on the next song. Uh, song that I first would have known from its inclusion here as sort of a, to my mind, a, a cousin of Ride On Baby, uh, and that is Please Go Home. And absolutely, like, so this is, this is the real continuation of the kind of blues deconstruction, fucking around with the form, uh, using the studio as an instrument, uh, thing that they got into with uh, uh, Who's Driving Your Plane. This song is amazing. I absolutely love it. It's based on just a really basic Bo Diddley beat. Uh, is Keith on all the guitars? No, Brian, Brian is playing too, which I guess that makes sense because there is a lot of weaving going on. But Brian is also playing Mellotron and going nuts with the oscillator. So this is a you know, the, the, the combination of the, like, fragmentary uh, uh, guitar playing and, and the oscillator, it's awesome. Like, the, the weird studio effects, the, the, weird, the, the percussion, it is, you know, again, it's sort of, it's this weird mutated blues that is, on one hand, a great song, on the other hand, purely a bonkers, bananas, uh, you know, gonzo, if you will, uh, you know, uh, studio experiment. I absolutely love it. I love the energy of it. I love the vibe and attitude of it, the, the youthful, we don't care of it. Uh, and it is the next continuation after Who's Driving Your Plane. If the Stones were more of an underground band and weren't chart titans to rival the biggest acts of the time, they might have just done entire albums like this, of, of just totally, like, 
subterranean deconstructions of musical forms. They who knows they could have they could have they could have been a beef heart kind of thing. Uh, but uh, this is pretty in its own way. This is pretty beef hearty in uh, as it is. And and you know I think that sometimes um, you know people don't necessarily sort of put together just how you know just how bonkers some of this stuff actually is, you know. Um, the next song, so, you know, we've had Mick clearly influenced by Ray Davies. This is Mick clearly influenced, and we've had them influenced by the Beatles in kind of a, I don't know, on a, on, on a just sort of a general level. Uh, the next song, uh, one I love, uh, Who's Been Sleeping Here? This is the, this is the most... Uh, Dylan influenced, you know, it, it sounds like it's going for a blonde on blonde kind of grandeur, but again, it's the Stones and it's the Stones in 1966, you know, and it's these guys, it's these weird, windswept, hazy, starry eyed young gentlemen uh, who, uh, you know, who, who don't, don't care about nothing, uh, you know. As Muhammad Ali said about Leon Spinks, they're crazy and they don't care about nothing. <laughs> and uh, so it's filtered through through that. And the fact that it sounds like it was recorded at the same party that All Sold Out was recorded at. Like, again, it, so it's going for this grandeur and this sweep. And, and Mick has the, ca the Dylan-esque cast of characters. Uh, and he's singing it in that same kind of Dylan in Nashville at 4 a.m., barely awake, s struggling to, you know, sort of, you know, connecting things out in the ether sort of vibe of Blonde on Blonde. But it's all shot through with this, like, f f like damn the torpedoes, who who cares sort of carpe diem joie de vivre. And, uh, and I love that. I love that about, about the song. And... Um, you know, just and, and also what's interesting is just the fact that like Mick sort of throws in stuff that would have you know they were obviously trying to goad the establishment with with aftermath and those singles. This again, it's just so interesting because they're not even like trying. So the idea that, that the that the girl in question is clearly bisexual and having affairs, you know, uh, with guys and girls, and that Mick it, it doesn't care. He just wants to know who's been saying, you know, and that she's she's going all up and down the, you know, she's she's an equal opportunity uh, pleaser, I suppose. Uh, it's just it, it's scandalous, like sort of in its own like in its own way. It's not trying to be like an affront at this point, but somebody hearing this who is from the previous generation could theoretically be scandalized by it. Um, I absolutely love it. And Brian, um, you know, from being the great blues harmonica player that he is, uh, first of all, he's on auto harp on this, but he's the one doing the Dylan skeleton keys in the rain, thin wild mercury harmonica playing. He, he, he nails it. Like it's, I love it. Like it could totally have been flown in from the Nashville sessions. And I love that Brian just, gets on the vibe and just and runs with that uh and and who is playing okay jack nietzsche is playing the piano here he's kind of the quiet all-star of this because god damn his piano playing on this is just incredible like it really gives it uh, a scope and sweep and beauty um and uh there, there is no sourness to it in a in a weird way uh i love it it's it's a great song um and then, and then we get complicated. So, Brian and Keith on guitars. Brian also does an organ part. Um, Charlie doing great, obviously playing drums, but also adding really, really cool percussion. Um, it's, it's an interesting song because it's, I feel like this could have been maybe like a hit single for 
I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe the animals, maybe them. I feel like this, maybe even the pretty things, like this could have been a, somebody else's single. But for the Stones, it's just a great song in the middle of side two on their album. Um, I I do love the song. It's, it's an interesting character study. Uh, uh, you know, another sort of, you know, rich girl. Uh, but... Um, so it's another character study. Um, it maybe doesn't have the the depth that some of the other songs do on this album, but it just it is a great song. And again, maybe with a different production. And if they had uh, if they had written the song and given it to somebody, like I could totally see it being a hit single um, that sort of has nothing to do with the Rolling Stones. I think it fits perfectly well on the album and 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 kind of keeps things moving. Um, and uh, where does it move to? It sets up perfectly. It sets up the next song. And that is um, one of my all-time favorites, Miss Amanda Jones. Uh, I first heard this song... I think the movie is called Some Kind of Wonderful. I had a boyhood crush on... Uh, I think her name was Mary Stuart Masterson. And there's a scene in that movie, If I'm, I, I hope I'm not misremembering all of this but she is getting ready for like the prom or the big party or they're gonna take away the youth rec center or whatever whatever the hell the plot of the movie is i don't even remember eric stoltz is in it but uh but i had a, a thing for mary stewart masterson uh when i was really young i had a thing for a lot of women I mean, let's face it and um she could really she really could rock the the tomboy haircut uh, she looked she looked really good and there's she's like getting ready for the prom and like she's like in and out of the shower and putting on makeup and uh and they they put it to this song and uh i didn't even know that it was i was too young to know that it was the rolling stones but i i knew that i liked the song and i knew that i liked her and i knew that i liked seeing her get ready for the prom or whatever the hell it was that they were doing in that movie like the big school dance or the big homecoming game or whatever the whatever it is, I don't know. At any rate, uh, but so many years later, all of a sudden, I discovered this song on this album and was like, "Oh my god, that's from that move that '80s movie." Um, and uh, I love the how do I phrase it? The sort of auteurness of it that the Stones are now so confident in their ability to write in all these different genres and all these different forms that for almost like for old time's sake, almost as like a, like a, with a nudge and a wink, they write a old fashioned Chuck Berry, Rolling Stones, rock, rock and roll song. And um, except the lyrics are Mick in Dylan mode, uh, chronicling uh, the the uh, misadventures of uh, another Miss Lonely, and um, but in uh, but in sort of again a carefree carpe diem, who cares kind of way, and it's just it's just really cool to get a and Mick is awesome. I mean Mick uh, Keith is uh, especially awesome on guitar on this one. Brian doesn't play on this again. So like uh, like connection, this is all Keith. And he's the one put, putting together all those awesome interlocking guitar parts. The man can just weave with himself. And um, I love it. It is just a great, 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 great rock and roll song. And it's cool that they show you that they can do it. Kind of like, not that these two songs are connected, but kind of like Dr. Robert on, um, on Revolver. You know, amongst... All the sophistication, you've just got this great rock and roll song, uh, except in both cases with modernist, of-the-moment lyrics, right? And very kind of New York lyrics, if you know about the, you know, Edie Sedgwick kind of Dr. Dr. Robert, whatever the hell his name was, uh, you know what I'm saying. Um, so anyway, uh, so that's the second to last song on the record, and then, and, then, and then we get to the final song on the album, and it is... Uh, it is just one of my absolute favorite things that the Rolling Stones ever did. Your, you know, your your opinion might vary on this one. It may, this may not work for you. And again, kind of like uh, uh, Cool, Calm, Collected, I think this song probably drives a lot of people nuts. 
but I absolutely fucking love Something Happened to Me Yesterday. I love everything about it. I love, um, I love that it is a British fourth time around version of Rainy Day Women, <laughs> numbers 12 and 35. I love the, I love Keith editorializing Mick. Uh, Keith sounds great. Keith sounds, Keith's insouciance, and he really doesn't care at all. Like, I, just, I love all of that. I, it is a brilliant, awesome knees up. It is like a great, it's, it is a great sort of pass at that kind of old timey, but it's not really music hall. It's so, you know, Brian started off as a jazz musician and uh, I remember many, many years after his death, I was reading an interview with Mick and they said, what do you think Brian would have done if he had never discovered blues and then rock and roll and, and, or if rock and roll hadn't happened. And Mick said he would have been playing trad and Cheltenham. Right, and, and that's what he would have been doing. He would have been in some small little big band doing weekend uh, or doing like summer gigs in the Butlins, you know? And um, and that <clears throat> that's the musical language and the context, the pre-rock and roll context of the Rolling Stones and of their upbringing. They, you know, they predate rock and roll. And I love, love, love that they are using the musical language of their childhoods, basically, or their parents' music, or their parents' parents' music, and just doing this total send-up of it. I the but also again with this weird twist of modernist lyrics about the the guy on the mat about to pray, like you know he's following an Indian guru, uh, he's following a mystic from the east, like I love all of that and 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 the attitude about like you know there's there's uh something more to pay for sins you might have committed along the way uh is really rather drippy like i love it and i love keith i love Char like charlie's little i got the little breakdowns and charlie like yes it's a not nudge nudge wink wink drug song but i to me, it's it's actually bigger than that. To me, it, it is. It's about generations. It's about um, emerging attitudes. It's about challenging conventions and morality, uh, and uh, ideologies, and uh, it. But not in a overly self serious way. I just I I just love the entire thing, and especially at the end. Uh, and and what it is. Supposedly, Brian might be playing sax on this. He d he played sax on, um, you know, my name. Look up the number. That's sort of absurd. So who knows? Maybe he is playing on this. But I love the the British like the session musicians. I love that if this movie, if this if this movie, if this record is a movie that has been shot on a soundstage and it's using the artificiality to highlight certain things happening and certain dynamics happening. I, but but it's all again very sort of modernist, and there's references to, you know, the, uh, changing attitudes about about uh, the drug culture and premarital sexual relations and bisexuality and flaunting social mores across the board. Uh, you know, uh, again, kind of a uh, a newer version of of Brando saying, "What do you got?" and them sort of taking it all on, but. Uh, you know, I love the idea that at the very end, it turns like into like a 40s musical. Like, I love that. I love that they just totally, again, upend even themselves and just have this absurd outro with Mick as like, you know, doing like a mock radio broadcast from the 40s, you know, and I just, I love that the modernist film shot that's shot weird and looks and is lighted and looks kind of weird then they use those same backdrops to just make it a fucking musical and at the final end and like they're the guy and the girl are dancing and singing about moon and june together as they like look yearningly at, at, into each other's eyes and then uh away from the camera like i love it it's so it's absurd it's funny it's charming it's charming 
I love it. You know, and I, I who doesn't love being charmed? Uh, so this is an amazing album, and I am going to say it's a masterpiece. Look at these guys. What kind of music do these guys make? My God. You know, just look at them. Look at this group of young men. Smart asses. You know, what do you got? They don't, you know, they're crazy, and they don't care about nothing. Amazing. I love them. So anyway, that... <laughs> That's Between the Buttons, an album that in and of itself is Between the Buttons and whose reputation over the past, Jesus, whatever, 60 years or whatever it has been, uh, is in Between the Buttons. So in my own sweet way, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do it justice and, you know. So anyway, um, uh, moving right along. 